mar- uh, when uh, that particular hat has been had, I usually been mentioned. I usually say you might not know this is archaeology part of the university itself, but, but of course, uh, you've been all good Northwest people, particularly the Pedlins, you'll be well aware of the, an archaeology department at the University of Salford since 2009, won't you? Because uh, you're, you're very knowledgeable. Um, my job really this morning is to um, talk, I suppose, to give some background to one particular project that is starting this month that's funded by Historic England, which is an update of the Northwest Regional Research Framework. But in order to do that, um, I need to step back and think a little bit about frameworks, research, and particularly the value of community and volunteer uh, research at a regional and local level. Although I wasn't here yesterday, I did, did, did follow some of the tweets online, and I know that you've already had some discussions around the impact of voluntary and community archaeology and the value and the importance of that. So hopefully what I'm going to say will fit into that particular uh, discussion uh, without overlapping it uh, too much. Uh, there are really two major studies on the value and impact of community archaeology work and I suppose we now have to spread that out into local history uh, research as well. And those two studies are done by Council of British Archaeology and the Mike in 2010 and then we have a new study from Historic England from 2016. And it's worth putting the results together to look at the impact of the voluntary sector on exploring our past, because that's part of the background that the Northwest Regional Research Framework is dealing with. Um, community involvement in the heritage of Britain obviously goes back an enormously long way. We can you know, take it back into to the Victorian revival of uh, local history studies, to the Georgian antiquarianism, and, um, back even further than that. It's always difficult, I find, to translate a general interest into actual activity. So however many millions of people might watch television, history and archaeology programs, a small portion of those actually go on to um, take an active part in discovering their own past. And increasingly, I think we're faced with the fact that lots of individuals who might be inspired by a weekend or holiday ramble around an ancient site, whether it be a ruin or humps and bumps, um, or inspired by the latest television or uh, YouTube video on history and archaeology, increasingly large numbers of those people don't actually like joining societies. Um, I'm sure most side archaeology society you're dealing with exactly the same problem that everybody else is, which is people seem slightly more reticent about joining what they might regard as a more traditional society. And um, they're happy to be involved in individual things and perhaps um, happy to be involved in societies which have a bit more sort of campaigning element to them and that's advocacy. That's certainly something that we have to uh, have to look at and face. Uh, <coughs> what I'm talking about this morning is, is trying to take an overview on the impact in the region in terms of community and voluntary engagement. Now, I'm not going to include Cumbria, I'm going to take the traditional counties of Lancashire and Cheshire, Merseyside, Greater Manchester, and stuff like this. But we have to also acknowledge that there are large scale uh, national programmes that also volunteers are involved with and being CBA trustee, I should be very self- selfish and mention two particular CBA um, initiatives. Um, one which hooked up with the Association for Industrial Archaeology around training, building, uh, building training, training for people involved in looking at industrial structures and commenting on those in the planning process, which is a project that ran from 2009 to 2012, ended up with um, an industrial archaeology handbook being produced, but also we ended up training uh, 
I think it's around 735 individuals, professionals and volunteers across England in, how, in what the key buildings are to uh, uh, how, what you should look for with a listed building that's an industrial structure that is threatened by the development. Uh, I think the sad irony of that is that it's some fantastic training with a very great output in terms of legacy, but in terms of the professionals, at least half the professionals we've talked to in that 2009 to 2012 period have gone. Volunteers oh, haven't, professionals haven't. Maybe there's a case for, for rolling that, that kind of thing out again. That's a very specific piece of nationally targeted training and it was around the regions including the Northwest. Something that's much broader, something that CBA has done on a number of different occasions. Um, in this case, it's a national project around World War One and legacy, uh, which is getting to thousands of volunteers, thousands of people who might not uh, necessarily engage in other types of community work. Is running alongside all the commemorations of World War One as a website. And there are train. Uh, uh, there's a there's a whole series of training packages aimed at uh, existing and new groups that have never been involved in offshore before. Those are the kind of national uh, initiatives uh, which go on from time to time, which I think the CBA is in a very good position to promote, particularly with its network. Of uh, regional groups who hopefully have good links with their uh, own regional and local uh, societies. I sometimes think that because these are national projects, it can be difficult to see. In, you know, if you talk to an individual society, they might find it difficult, possibly, to relate to some of these. And not saying that's the case for Home Front at all, nor indeed the expensive Britain project from the 1990s, but there is a danger with a national project that uh, that more local focus is harder to grab. Which I think is one of the reasons why the CBA commissioned research on the role and impact of community archaeology and heritage projects back in the late 2000s. And, and those are some very similar reasons as to why English, uh, English heritage as it was historically is now picked up that work in 2014 2015. Um, the work itself, I, 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 the, this piece of work I think is a foundation piece of work. It's a real touchstone in, in providing a snapshot of community activity in the whole of the UK. Notice that map there, the whole of the UK. So we can say with some confidence that about 200 of uh, 15,000 people are actively involved some way in exploring their heritage across the UK. And that's spread across 2,000 plus organisations. And I don't think those, those figures have substantially changed in the last six or seven years because, as I mentioned a moment, the Historic England report paints a very similar picture. What you can see is that active involvement what we mean by active involvement is not just people digging holes in the ground, but maybe people doing landscape survey, um, trawling through historic photographs and historic maps, um, has grown since the 1980s, more than uh, doubled. And that's a fantastic active base to work from. Uh, you'll see on that map that uh, the northwest there, there's, there's quite a few clusters around Chester, Liverpool, and Manchester, uh, as you would. Uh, expect. The Historic England study, which was published this summer, um, took a slightly different angle. Of course, Historic England has this phrase, the historic environment, which uh, for good or ill, we have as a concept. We're all archaeologists here, so, so we know that archaeology being research about the physical remains of the past includes everything from documents into pieces of pot, but um, getting that concept across uh, it's not always straightforward. So this idea that the historic environment emphasises both the public and the ground remains. One of the things they set out to do specifically here was to provide some foundation work ahead of revamping the promotion of 
research frameworks, which English Heritage has been doing since the late 1980s, and now Historic England. And this particular project was aimed at both archaeologists and local historians, which is a very interesting way of uh, approaching it, with the intention that the assessment would ask, do people use fra re research frameworks? Do they talk to their historic environment uh, record officers? Do they uh, liaise with the archaeology and heritage planning? advisory services, do they use their local studies library and uh, local uh, archive service? Three study areas you see there uh, across England, and this is an English study um, which is useful, obviously the CDA study was a UK study, uh, so we have to bear that in mind. Um, about 619 people and in the individuals and organisations responded to this, <coughs> including several outside of England in uh, Wales, which is quite interesting. And um, you can see that in terms of groups involved, there was a fair <coughs> difference between local history societies and local archaeology societies, Pro probably slightly more in terms of local archaeology societies. And then there's a whole, there's sort of about 45% of the respondents were uh, individuals or other other groups like uh, civic societies. Part of capturing what's going on is capturing impact and capturing the kind of activities uh, that these groups undertake and um, trips to site and excavation work are something that local archaeology societies spend a lot of time doing, also recording through photography uh, literature research, you can see the balance of activity is very much towards your archaeology involvement, very much towards physical involvement out in uh, the landscape. Um, in an English context, looking at both archaeology and history, uh, you can see some of the same, um, same approaches here in terms of what do you do as an individual or as a group. Um, Archaeological survey field walking, geophysics features very prominently, but because of course they were talking to local history societies, you see that this band there, that is archival research. Of course, we as archaeologists do archival research, so the local historians, as, as local history is as much about documents as it is about landscapes, it's perhaps not surprising that leaps out. Um, all of this is fantastic material for providing baseline data for what local individuals and groups do in terms of investigating their own particular uh, patch. The Historic England study also then went on to look at what happens to this research. And this is research. There's that old uh, happy phrase that all archaeology is research, and you can say all, all history is research as well. There's different ways of doing research, and there's different levels of doing research. And if you look on the right here, you know, where did you send that research to? Well, there's a small element who just went, well, we can do a search for, for myself or our group, and we can do it, which is passing it on to anybody else. But actually, um, a lot of them did pass it on to other groups, um, particularly historic environment records, that 51% of all respondees sent information into their, their county or borough HER, and the record office, that 57% of people um, deposited material with their local uh, record office. And we also have group archives, which you can see down here at 77 Percent. Um, I know from my own experience as chair of City in the West that we have lots and lots of group ar archives, and what actually gets deposited with the local record office or the HDR is only a proportion of what group has recovered. And there quite clearly is an issue around what you do with those group archives. Um, I'm sure we all have experience of groups who come and go, because that's what groups do. And it's very much around a few people, and when they disappear, um, that, that material can end up in a skip, literally. Um, and 
and that's, that's something that we know happens. And you can see here uh, on the graph with 77% of groups, archive material there being the main place where they deposit their research. You can see why that might be a problem. Another thing that the Historic England study asked was where, does this, where do you get money from to research your local past? And um, external funding for specific projects was right up there, but also money from members, uh, resources, and funds raised through society activities were very important as well. So actually, um, most of this money is being raised locally and where it, uh, by the members, where it's where they get grants from outside bodies, uh, HLF, you can see here, the blessed HLF, may, they, may have the Heritage Lottery Fund continue forever, please, <laughs> provides the central point of <coughs> this kind of community archaeology and history activity. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room knows that actually HLF has its own targets and they're not necessarily researching the past for the past, but for its own sake, is something they would fund. But they do fund projects, lots, dozens and dozens of projects that have a history and archaeology element to them at a local level. So we've had in the last 20 years a real boom in the number of projects that are funded in that way. Just to show, throw a few up here, uh, there's lots more I could mention. I could I didn't have a slide for the Morgan Bay uh, partnership, for instance, who've been excavating Bronze Age barrow barrows and World War II trenches in the last 12 months with HLF funding. But some projects you will, you will be aware of. Obviously, Rainford, I just put that up there. Um, Dig, Great, Dig Manchester, uh, the Mellor projects with the Mellor Archaeological Trust, and just Amphitheatre, all projects over the last two decades that have received HLF funding for major participatory community archaeology projects with some history thrown in as well in a couple of uh, cases. Generating large amounts of information, large amounts of archive material. I'm glad to say that there are publications and archive material that have been deposited on all the projects you can see. Up there, but there isn't necessarily always a requirement for nature of funding for the archive itself to be deposited in a safe place. Yes, there's a requirement for outputs that can be measurable, but the archive itself, the, the, the more uh, theoretical research ideas themselves, are not necessarily part of, uh, part of that package. These, these are the kind of things that both that HLF funding and the local groups themselves have been uh, undertaking in the sort of last 20 years while the HLF has been around. Excavation is very much at the centre of that. It's a truism that archaeology defines itself by excavation, but we all know it's much more than just the process of excavation. You can see here. Um, workshops, seminars, tools, work experience, social media, public open days, popular publications, they're all part of the package of undertaking that exploration of the past, the research and the outputs. It's worth pointing out that if we're looking at the way in which local groups are involved with their own past and the kind of research they do, there are other sources of funding, there are other ways of getting those groups to uh, explore their locality, one of which is to use a local group's particular specialism to support professional sector, professional archaeologists undertaking developer-funded work through the planning process. Um, example here at the Ashby's Railway Works in Manchester, where the Manchester Region, the Region Industrial Archaeology Society had some specific skills and knowledge on railway history and the construction of railway uh, wagons and boilers that was used 
uh, to inform the professional excavation of uh, railway carriage rooms uh, with its huge number of flues and furnaces. It was a very successful partnership where both the professional archaeologists and the voluntary archaeologists benefited from that relationship. In terms of getting the material out, um, I've already commented that, that there's uh, lots of the research ends up in the society or individual archives, but about half of the material is deposited either with the HDR or with the county or local record or, or local studies office. Now we mustn't forget that there is a very long tradition of producing publications in archaeology. The North West is no exception. I point to these uh, eight particular front covers as covering eight, what I regard as major series, major vehicles for publishing that information in a slightly more traditional way. Not old-fashioned, but traditional way. So we've got three county journals at the top there, with the side archaeology society, very own journal of course. Chester Archaeological Society and the Cumberland and Westmoreland. Uh, we have um, then below that five regional series um, CBA Northwest has its own regional journal, Archaeology Northwest. We've got uh, archaeology units producing their own series as well. So that's the Lancaster imprints from Oxford North. We have the Chester Archaeology's own series. Um, and then down at the bottom, uh, Johnny Cumberland, he's my own archaeology units, uh, two series as well since 2009. So there are major vehicles regionally that allow the publication of this material, and it's not exclusively professional by any means, it's a real, it's not really a real effort, effort across these major series to include local societies and individuals working in that voluntary sector. And I'm sure that will remain the case. We also have, in terms of published material, over the last 20 years, a plethora of individual books, monographs, uh, across the region. It's always very difficult to capture this material. Um, as we embark on updating the Northwest Regional Research Framework, one of the early things we're doing is capturing what's been published since 2006. And that's, that's already running into hundreds of different items. Um, so this kind of material is coming out all the time. It's very difficult to keep on top of that. Um, because so, so much of this material can be on short print runs and produced by the local society and perhaps doesn't get the distribution that the research uh, warrants. That's the background, if you like, for why Historic England is funding an update on the regional research frameworks. I'm going to move on to talk about what that involves and how it's different from the process that took place in the 1990s and 2000s. Historic England are funding a number of research frameworks uh, initiatives, not just on a regional level but also on, um, on a World Heritage Site level and also uh, on a thematic or multiple period society level as well. These are four that are, that are, are current. East Midlands has just been published um, and the East Midlands revision moved towards publication online, interactive publication online using something that's called Wikis and one of those interactive websites where you, you can add to it to expand it. The other three there, North East, North West and East of England, are the new regional research frameworks initiatives that start broadly this month and they're going to run concurrently and Dan Miles who's heading this at Historic England, his strategy and I think it's quite a sensible one was to, to run a number of these together, so particularly at a regional level, so that you could have cross fertilisation and a similarity of approach, but also so that each region could perhaps focus on one or two things in depth and then um, bring that experience 
to the other other regions, uh, and that might actually capture more in terms of different approaches and different outcomes. Updating regional research frameworks. Well, there is a fundamental question here, which is why bother? And hopefully, that's been answered by the work I've just gone through, both the CDO work in 2010 and the historic England work in 2016. It matters because all the research is not just done by the four or five thousand pieces of individual developer funded professional archaeology work that goes on each year across the UK. There are hundreds of other pieces of work that contribute to building up a better picture of uh, the past. Now, research frameworks as a vehicle for capturing that traditionally have been point in time documents. Uh, on the left, of, left I'm sure you recognise them. The front cover of the first of the two volumes of the first uh, regional research framework for the Northwest. We were one of the last regions to, uh, to finish that, uh, that round of uh, regional research framework analysis. There is still the Southeast, which is outstanding, which is sort of stalled halfway through. Um, over here, on this dotty map there, is an, an attempt in 2016 by Historic England to capture awareness of regional research frameworks. And the key thing to, to note here is the brown dots are individuals and groups who are aware of regional research framework documents or period framework documents or local research framework documents and, or, and have used them or have uh, knowledge of them. And you can see less than 50% of all the respondents are really aware of this particular source of information, which is a real shame because these are very, these are very important documents. So the North West, for instance, that resource assessment volume there, the Archaeology of North West England, as a point in time statement from 2006, is not really going to be substantially out of date for decades. It's, it's always going to be there as a foundation document. I was at a conference about, uh, celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Cumberland of Westland and the Grand Society. So, uh, you've only got 110 years to go. Um, uh, a month ago, and I was approached after, after I'd given the talk, because uh, I'd mentioned regional research frameworks, and, and I had question, the same question from two people who recorded, which was should we be throwing away that document? No, absolutely not. That's, that's a fundamental cornerstone of what we're doing with the uh, revision. There are some mechanisms that we're going to use over the next 18 months. It's an 18 month project running from October 2016 through to April 2018. And it's not, because it's not a complete rewriting of what's gone before, uh, it's a much shorter process, and because it's focusing on research topics and outputs, it's also going to be much more of a, in one sense, it's going to be more of a debate, it's going to be more interactive than it was before. And this is the process we're about to go through. We will update the period by like period statements very, very briefly, and we're going to be, um, we're, we're going to be. Uh, very specific about that. So we're asking individuals to summarise what's gone on in the last 10 years for, say, the Roman period or the medieval period. We're using two individuals from the Christophe period because it's so big. And that will be capturing publications, grey literature reports, local society activities. And we're doing that over a, a three month period. And then we're moving into the major bit of the project which is thinking about what is important in terms of research themes by period and also by themes, which is slightly different from last time. So the built environment is part of this, uh, part of this process. Which is why when we come to our stakeholders, uh, we've identified, we continue to identify, Sue reminded me the other day of this particular organisation of this contacts, which is fine. Um, we have over a hundred groups that we will be contacting 
and then towards the end of this year for their input into this process, which sounds horrific in one sense, but actually is terrific in terms of the reservoir of uh, knowledge we can draw on. There'll be a series of regional period seminars at which we're not asking people to say, this is what we found, this is what we found. We're asking them to think about what is important about what we have and what we've got and where, where the major uh, research has been in the last 10 years and where it might be in the next five to 10 years and particularly where development hotspots might be, where there are blanks in our uh, knowledge. So we're looking to build, a, uh, the jargon is a stakeholder network across the built environment sector and the voluntary sector. In other words, professionals and volunteers. Archaeology, but also those professions involved in looking at buildings. And that means talking to Institute of Historic Building Conservation. It means talking to the few vernacular architecture groups we have in the region. We're also going to try and talk to civic societies as well um, to see what their take is on this kind of material. There will be two conferences, one, one early next year and one at the end of the process. Um, and at the end of all that, um, we will have a mass of data that we will then take into the next, next stage of the project, which is to create the interactive online research resource. So this stage is the first stage. It's not about the inter interactive online resource at this stage. It's about gathering the data. It's about prioritising where we think research should be focused and also trying to identify the hotspots of research, the hotspots of development and where there are blanks and then feeding that into the, the planning process. And throughout that, we've got these three things we need to think about. How do we link to national and regional agendas? How do we control the many voices in that process? And how do we provide practical information, implementation of the research on the ground? All the topics, all three topics we're going to talk about throughout the 18 month life of the first stage of the project. And that involves local authority curators, it involves contractors, it involves academics, it involves community groups. I really ought to put on there individuals as well. It's very much an information uh, exercise. And at the end of that, what's the vision? We will have a point in time document, which is the revision of the period summary document we're doing at the moment. But we will also have the vision is. Not only do we have that point in time document, which would be very handy in terms of uh, planning, but also the vision is for a, a single platform, a dynamic online platform, where many research individuals and communities can go and add their own material. So the idea is that the three regional research frameworks will have will all be up there on this single wiki platform with their own pages and their own ability to comment and add to it so it's a living document. Of course, that means having the buy-in from people like yourselves, as well as all the other groups in the region. It also means having some kind of system that allows you to update that in a controlled manner so that we don't get, um, shall we say, uh, unfortunate comments added to the document. And that's a process which we can see that in Scotland, SCARF, the Scottish Research, uh, uh, Archaeology Research Framework people, have been under undertaken for three or four years, and they, they have some mechanisms which is uh, useful to look at at the second stage of the project. So it might sound a bit mechanistic, but it's about building on the research community we have now, and central to that research community are societies like your own and individual voluntary researchers. And if we can build on that and make that website a success, then actually that should give us a stronger voice about what we need to concentrate in terms of research locally and regionally in the future, but also a stronger voice for saving crucial elements of the past, dealing with those people 
who would rather dismiss uh, the landscape around us as valueless and in need of being wiped away to build the, the great new future uh, that we all want, whereas in fact it's about identity, people and place, and that's really where we come back to with the idea of the modern Thank you.